Prayer of illumination together. God, God of, of all power, power open, open our ears, ears our eyes, and our hearts with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And revelation. Help, Help us, us to hear your voice, to see your ways, and to receive the joy, joy your truth. truth. In Jesus' name, Amen. Pastor Jovi. Please be seated. Thank you, Anthony, and the musicians for leading us in the time of worship and music. We continue in our worship with the listening to God's Word and we are continuing in our sermon series on Nehemiah and today we are on a servant's protection in Nehemiah chapter 6. And uh, today we'll be reading uh, verses 1 to 16. Um, I'll leave it to you to read it, the whole passage on your own. But let us now listen to the Word of the Lord in Nehemiah 6. Um, and there will be parts in the reading of the Scriptures where you will see on the screen uh, words in bold and in red I'm going to invite all of us, when we come to those parts, to read it all together. And so the word of the Lord in Nehemiah 6, beginning from verse 1, when word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, Gershom, the, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sambalat and Gershom sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sambalat sent his assistant to me with the same message and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Gershom says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king, and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mahitabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, in my previous occupation, I, I accompanied my boss to meet a client and this client called us to meet uh, the director to discuss our tender for their project. It turned out that they liked our, pro uh, our proposal, but they wanted it at a lower cost. Well, we had done our calculations in our tender submission and our price was fair. And so when we went to that meeting, the negotiations began. And they set us right in front of the air conditioner at that time. And at some point, my boss asked if they could adjust the temperature because he was feeling very cold. The director very pointedly said, no. In fact, we had purposely put you in front of the aircon. So now let's wrap up our meeting as soon as possible. Can you meet our price? 
No one from the client's team went to adjust the aircon. I wanted to object there and then and say something, but I saw that I was still a newbie. I was there mainly to assist my boss administratively, so I kept quiet. And frankly, I was fearful then also to talk in front of the director unless my boss asked. Well, my boss didn't ask me. Uh, he did some of his own quick calculations and he finally agreed to their price. The price would mean us almost operating at material cost. I had gone through the calculations with my boss before and so, while I was surprised that he agreed at that meeting, I reasoned that maybe he had a strategic reason for agreeing to that price. When we went back to the office and we discussed the outcome of the meeting, I realized that the decision was not due to strategy, but due to miscalculation under duress. My boss never blamed me, but I saw that my fearfulness had also contributed to that outcome. Well, we tried writing in again to request for another meeting, but the deal was sealed and the client refused to budge. Now, as you go through life, doing your best to live honestly, rightly and kindly, or perhaps you're striving in a particular task as a servant of God, have you ever been intimidated by something or someone? Have you been intimidated to give up or to give in? And this could be anything. The intimidation could be anything. It could be due to the hardness, the, the difficulty of a task. Or it could be unforeseen complexities that come up. It could be a looming deadline with a major problem that's unresolved. It could be unfamiliarity. Or it could be unfriendliness of people. It could be unsupportive, even backstabbing colleagues or family. It could be a sudden loss in the midst of what you're doing. It could be a debilitating illness, something that has robbed you of your capacities. It could be demanding expectations from others. It could be past failures and the prospect of even more failures. It could be rising costs with rising obligations. It could be loneliness. The list can go on and on. Perhaps it may even include violent threats like what Nehemiah and his team of war builders faced. Now, not everyone experiences such intimidation and we thank God for that. But the truth is that many do and some suffer it silently. And friends, this is reality. It is life. It is reality in a sin-filled, fallen world. It is a reality even for Christians. And in some cases, it is a reality precisely because you are a Christian. Later today at the 10.30 a.m. service, we will be witnessing the baptism of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And our baptism, we know, is the outward sign instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ for those who wish to commit to trust and follow Him. Baptism is a sign of the new covenant that a person enters with God. It is ratified by the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Baptism expresses the candidate's acceptance of God's grace and forgiveness and love. And it also expresses his commitment to be aligned to the word and the ways of God. It is a joyous thing to be baptized. It is a joyous thing to see someone being baptized. And the Bible tells us even the angels in heaven rejoice when they see someone baptized. But one thing that the Christian can be sure of in following Jesus, when we come forward to be baptized, there may be things that we may not know about the future, but there is one thing that we can be sure of. And that is, like Jesus, after he was baptized, the devil will not stop coming at you. The devil will not stop intimidating you. The devil will not stop tempting you to turn away from God. And so Jesus himself warned his disciples of the trials that truly following him would entail. He said, you will be hated by everyone because of me. You will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. And so brothers and sisters, to those who later on are going to be baptised, to all who are already baptised, and to all who will one day be baptized. If you are going to follow Jesus, if you are going to be a servant for Jesus' kingdom's cause, and Jesus wants you to do so with the full knowledge that you are, you are going to face trials of many kinds. In fact, you'll face more trials 
than if you remained a non-Christian. Because in addition to the trials non-Christians already face, you face the trial of being a Christian. And that is a trial of being more limited than ever before in how you choose to respond to trials that come to you. Some examples. In the past, you could choose to retaliate and exact revenge on those who oppose you. But now, Jesus takes that option off your list. You could choose to hate, but now you cannot. You could choose quick fixes, even immoral quick fixes. But now, bearing the name of Christ, you cannot. You could choose to numb your pain through sex, drugs, alcohol, and the like. But now, you cannot. You could choose to give up on goodness. You could choose to give up on righteousness. You could choose to even give up on life. But now, you cannot. You could choose to deny God. But now, you cannot. Not if you want to be a Christian recognized by Christ. And as we go through this list, I, I don't know if it sounds to you like it's quite a bad deal to be baptized. But we must say this, because Jesus does call all who want to follow him to count the cost of commitment to following him. Now, when Nehemiah was called by God to lead the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem, it was not a call to an easy task. It was not a call to a luxurious life. It was a call to mission. It was a call to serve a heavenly mission greater than any earthly ambition. It was a call to faithfulness. The call we take on to follow Christ and to be a servant of God's kingdom in our vows taken at our baptism is the same call as Nehemiah's. It is a hard call. But with such a hard call comes precious divine promises. Because while Jesus, earlier we heard, he warned of hatred and persecution by others, but he also promised that the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And Jesus also promised that this is the will of God who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, Jesus' promise here that he will lose none of all God the Father has given to him means that he will see to it that he will protect us in the face of trials that come our way just like a good shepherd guarding his sheep. And Jesus not only promised this, he also prayed for us. In John 17, Jesus prayed, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And so brothers and sisters, fellow servants of God, let us leave from this sanctuary today, knowing very clearly and without a hint of a doubt that God is our protector. Now, trusting in, God, trusting in God and following Jesus does not stop trials and opposition from coming at you, but trusting God and following Jesus will stop these trials and opposition from getting to you. Because God protects His servants, faithfulness overcomes fearfulness. And today, as we seek to live the Christian life, as we remember our own baptism, to live by the values of God's kingdom and to live for the restoration of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, we learn from Nehemiah. We learn from Nehemiah that intimidations will come at us. But we also learn from him how trusting God as our protector enables us to stand up to these things. So how does intimidation come at us? Well, firstly, intimidation aims to stop our service to the Lord one way or another. And that's what Nehemiah's enemies were doing. They were scheming to harm him on the innocent pretext of seeking a gentleman's conversation. And when Nehemiah did not fall for it, they made up a false accusation about him to try to force him to meet them. The detail that the letter carrying the rumour was unsealed is a way of saying that this letter could have been read by anybody and so a rumour was being spread about him. They could not discourage him into giving up, and so they schemed to eliminate him altogether. Well, Nehemiah did two things that we can learn to do when faced with intimidation. 
the first thing to do is to pray. Pray as Nehemiah did. And he prayed, now strengthen my hands. Pray for God to strengthen your hands, to be faithful to God's will. Pray for God to strengthen your hands, to resist fear and evil. And even as we pray, we saw earlier that as Christians, we have the assurance that Jesus has prayed for us and He continues to pray for us. And so you are not praying alone. So let's pray. Now strengthen my hands. The next thing we can do with Nehemiah is to seek and to stick with the truth when faced with accusations or rumours. In all things, when there's something, when a charge is brought against you, seek and stick with the truth. And if the truth is that you are indeed guilty of some measure of wrong, stick with the truth anyway. Don't deny it. Confess to the truth and then correct yourself. But if, if the truth is that you have acted righteously and with integrity, then no matter what comes at you, you have nothing to fear. Respond as Nehemiah did. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making it out of your head. Respond with truth. Stand by the truth. And then persist in faithfulness. So that's the first way intimidation comes at us and how knowing God as our protector enables us to stand up against it. The next way that intimidation comes at us is that if it fails to stop our service altogether, then intimidation will tempt us to solve the problem with easy but ungodly solutions. And that's what Nehemiah's enemies resorted to next. They knew that if they could not draw Nehemiah to do, or rather they knew that if they could draw Nehemiah to do something sinful, then he would be discredited. And the work will no longer have a leader to see to its completion. Now, if that trial was not bad enough, the temptation would come from someone Nehemiah trusted enough to go to his house. And so sometimes in the midst of doing God's work, perhaps the trial is a betrayal of a close friend, much like Jesus also and Judas. And so this Shemaiah would betray Nehemiah for money. He tempted Nehemiah to enter the temple to save his skin when only priests were permitted to enter the temple. Now, when such temptations come, they are usually accompanied by rationalization that goes something like this. If I do this, if I enter the temple, surely God would understand and He would not count this against me. I mean, I'm just breaking a religious rule, right? It is not some moral rule. It is not going to harm anyone. And... There is a greater good that will come out of this. It will save a life. It will save my life. Surely God would understand. Now, with such rationalization, it may seem that the temptation is pitting God's mercy versus God's justice, right? Sometimes we, we grapple with it, God's mercy versus God's justice, and we, can't, and we are in a dilemma. But that's a false pitting. That's a false dilemma. Because the truth is that the temptation is not pitting God's mercy versus His justice. The temptation is pitting our allegiance to God versus our allegiance to our own sinful self. How God will judge, that's His prerogative. It is not a question we can presume to answer. While it is God's prerogative to judge, it is our integrity to be honest. To be honest about our own motivations and our own allegiances. Nehemiah knew that it was not God's integrity that was on trial, but his. And it was not just his life that was at stake, but the mission. And Nehemiah chose to act faithfully. How did he act faithfully? He acted according to what he clearly knew from the Word of God. There are sometimes in our temptations and rationalizations, we like to look for Scripture, parts of Scripture that is a bit grey, and we could argue it anyway, just to justify our actions. But there are other parts of Scripture that are super clear. And Nehemiah chose to act on the parts that he knew for sure were true. And he acted faithfully. Nehemiah trusted God to protect him, and therefore he could persist in faithfulness that overcomes fearfulness. Now, in Nehemiah's case, his life was preserved, he completed his mission of rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And as we read through the entire book of Nehemiah, we will not hear mention of his enemies again until the end of the book. 
And sometimes God does indeed protect us in that way, and our earthly lives are preserved. For the story I shared in the beginning, uh, my boss was a Christian. He maintained his integrity. He did not complain or sin against the Lord. He remained faithful to God's righteousness. He trusted God to work justice for him. And so he carried out the project on the agreed price, and the project would later result in many more business opportunities for the company. I, I, I did a calculation after I left the company. I calculated and it was a public project, so more projects started popping up. And as I calculated, it would be in the millions of dollars. But by then, I had already gone on to another path. Uh, that's why I'm here today. Maybe I should have stayed there. <laughs> that's a temptation. But in Scripture and the history of the church, a servant's life is not always preserved. We know that many Christians have faced trials, humiliation, violence, and death at the hands of their enemies. If not death or pain at the hands of human enemies, many faithful Christians have died at the hands of the enemy of one sickness or another. And all this while trusting God fully as their protector and healer. And when such tragedies occur, people may question, where, where is God's protection then? How can such calamity befall faithful Christians if God indeed is our protector? And it is hard. It is hard to see and comprehend such situations. And you know, you can look into the Bible and you will not find easy answers. Perhaps because there are no easy answers. There are no easy answers and there are no answers that will satisfy our fallen human logic. And so the Bible does not promise us or give us easy answers. But one thing we do have from God's Word in Jesus Christ is that in our trials, even though our trial may end with our suffering and death, God will not leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus Christ, God came and suffered with us. Jesus, the very Son of God, He too was misunderstood by His family. He too was betrayed and abandoned by His disciples, His close ones. He too was denied justice, humiliated, tortured, and then He was killed by pure evil. Was God protecting Him? we would be hard-pressed to say that God was not protecting him. But we see in the life of Jesus that God's protection does not always come in the preservation of our earthly lives, but it does come in the guarantee that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And it comes with the guarantee that not even death can kill you. After Jesus died on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And with that raising of Jesus from the dead, God demonstrated His protection to extend beyond our earthly existence. We may never comprehend why our earthly lives may not be preserved in God's plan of protection. But our eternal destinies of eternal life in God's eternal kingdom of righteousness, of peace, and of joy, these things are preserved in God's plan of protection. If we will stand firm to the end. And it is with this hope guaranteed by his resurrection that Jesus can encourage his disciples in their facing of trials. He said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet, not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So, brothers and sisters, your enemies, your sicknesses can only kill your body. After that, it can do no more. The God who has authority after you die to throw you into hell or the authority to welcome you into the kingdom of heaven, this God, is the God who protects you. It is the unrepentant persons who continue and persist in evil. It is the agents of sicknesses which oppose God's will. 
that will be thrown into hell. But for you, for you who will be faithful to the Lord, even if the world hates you, even if sickness and old age attacks you, you are worth more than many sparrows. Stay faithful to God. Never deny God. And you will find that God will more than protect and preserve you. On that day, He will make all things new for you. And so, brothers and sisters, with God's protection, we are not exempt from trials in life. But in the midst of those trials, we find freedom from fear and courage to face them. Greater than the absence of trials, the presence of peace and joy is God's promise to us as we trust and follow Him. Later on, we will say to those who are going to be baptised today, to all of us here who are already baptised, and to all who will one day be baptised, be faithful to follow Jesus. Be faithful to be a servant for His kingdom's cause. God is your protector, and in faithfulness, you will overcome fearfulness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As a closing prayer, I'm going to invite all of us to pray this psalm responsively, uh, following in the words in bold and red, Psalm 27. It is a prayer of God's protection, a prayer of confidence in the Lord. Let us pray. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army beseech me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent, and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord, be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. God, my Saviour, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Amen. Praise be to God.